Welcome once again to the Wise Heart Family Singers Chapel Hour. I trust that all is going well with you today, and I'm trusting that it, everything will go well with you the rest of the week, the rest of the month, the rest of the year, the rest of your life. There's a contrast in the New Testament between law and grace. Law says, do this and you will live. Grace says, live and you will do the well things. Law has two motives to compel people to keep uh, its precepts. It's uh, either a fear of punishment or desire for reward. Grace has one motive. Serve God faithfully all your life. Doesn't only matter. 
I want to read a couple of paragraphs out of a, an old book I have. Uh, the author was talking about agape love. Most people have heard the term agape over the years. This is uh, the God kind of love that you see in 1 Corinthians 13. And it's the God kind of love, or it's the human kind of love, that uh, I guess the best way to put it is it's the God type of love that we as humans are to exhibit towards uh, our fellow uh, Christians and fellow friends and neighbors. It says, so, so a Christian man who lives in this confidence towards God knows all things, can do all things, dares all things that are to be done, and does it all joyously and freely, not in order to collect many good merits and works, but because it is his delight so to please God, and he serves God absolutely for nothing. Now, I want you to notice that as I'm reading this, notice the point where this word nothing comes up. He serves God absolutely for nothing, content with this, that it pleases God. And if he is now quite free, the Christian will willingly make himself into a servant again to help his neighbor to deal with and treat him as God through Christ has treated him himself. And all this for nothing, seeking nothing therein but the divine pleasure and thinking thus, well now, my God has given me unworthy and lost man without any merit, absolutely for nothing, out of pure mercy, through and in Christ, the full riches of his godliness and blessedness, so that I henceforth need nothing more than to believe it is so. Well then, so for such is the Father, who has prodigale. <laughs> I think it means uh, just in his own uh, good will. He does it just because he wants to do it. There. He's lavished that upon me, his blessings. I will in return freely, joyously, and for nothing do what is well-pleasing to him, and also be a Christian towards my neighbor, as Christ has been to me. And I will do nothing except only what I see to be needful, useful, and blessed for him. Because I indeed, through my faith, have enough of everything in Christ. See thus, there flows from faith, love, and delight in God, and from love a free and willing, joyous life to serve our neighbor for nothing. For just as our neighbor suffers want and is in need of our superabundance, so have we suffered want before God and been in need of his grace. Therefore, as God through Christ has helped us for nothing, we ought through the body and its works to do nothing else but help our neighbor. Now, I remember a number of years ago, there, 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 the books are still out. One of the, the title of one of the books was, Where is God When It Hurts? And the title of the other uh, book was, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And that kind of fit in with a question that I had had in my mind for some time, and that's what I want to uh, share with you today, and that question was, will a man serve God for nothing? Now, in Psalm 73, we have uh, Asaph, who is telling you about an experience he had that almost caused him to fall. He said, my feet had well nigh slipped. And I really didn't understand all this stuff that was going in the world. I didn't understand uh, where God was when it hurt me. I didn't understand why bad things happened to good people and all that. But he said, I didn't understand it until I went to church. And then I understood that. So uh, the message that comes through in the book of Job is not so much the understanding of the inequalities of life 
and the unanswered questions as it is dealing with what kind of an attitude I should have when something like that happens to me. If I give and do not receive a tangible reward, what do I say? If I obey and my life is not filled with temporal blessings, what do I do? If I sing something good is going to happen to me and something bad happens, how do I react? Don't get me wrong. I believe God does bless those who give and obey. I believe that good things do happen to, uh, bad things do happen to good people. But in all honesty, I must ask the question, what if things don't happen just the way I think they should? Will I still remain faithful in my service to the Lord and His work? A question I have asked myself many times is this, will an individual serve God and even though they don't get anything out of it? Or to make it a, my thesis a little more theological for some of you, can I trust the revelation of God in Jesus Christ given under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit though and through the scriptures when everything in my circumstances seems to contradict it. A spiritual commitment so deep, do I? Can a man have a spiritual commitment so deep he will willingly serve God and experience no reward? Several years ago, I read three items that helped me to bring uh, this question even into sharper focus. Number one, uh, was some feedback I read about from pastors and superintendents when they would get applications from uh, men and women who wanted to go into the ministry. Two basic questions that, that the applicants would consistently ask were, how much will my salary be? What are the fringe benefits? Item number two was an article in Christianity Today in July 1980. And this was by David Hesselgrave, professor of missions at Trinity, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Deerfield, Illinois, uh, in Christianity Today, July 1980, page 25. <laughs> uh, many, this is what he said, many potential evangelical missionaries now view their involvement in missions in a new and an unbiblical way. They view it in terms of self-fulfillment and self-actualization rather than self-denial and self-discipline. Will I like it? Will I be happy? Will I be required to do tasks I'm not prepared for? Will I be successful? A student should refuse then to contemplate missions first in the terms of the self and its preferences, growth and realization, rather than in terms of Christ his command, his provision, and his greater glory. Item number three was a quotation from Christian Citizen, March 1981. The most, magnificent, the most magnificent theory ever devised for the control of behavior is called the law of reinforcement, which is stated simply, behavior which achieves desirable consequences will recur. In other words, behavior that is rewarded will recur. Now, this isn't all bad. James Dobson pointed out that we use this with our children as they are growing up. And even as adults, we should learn the value of positive reinforcement in, at the right time and in the right way. However, when reward and reinforcement overshadow service, then we may see some negative outworkings of a good theory. If families with children, if, if families when children behave only for reward, they may never learn that good behavior is right whether it's rewarded or not. In society, we see people wanting more pay and more benefits and more time for leisure in return for less work and less responsibility. And sometimes in the church, we often see those who serve only for reward and recognition, 
Others appear to do the irreducible minimum, and then they stop there. As I have already mentioned in the quotations from the articles I read on ministry and missions, the questions that are asked most often are, will I like it? Will I be happy? Will I be successful? Will I be paid well? Will I receive friends' benefits? Whether it is the world or the church, one writer has pointed out that the lesson we need to learn is that the man who is valued most is the man who goes beyond his duty and beyond what the law requires. So after reading these items, I begin looking for an answer to my question, can a man, uh, will a man work for God for nothing? No reinforcement, no reward, no profit, no prominence. So let me share with you three thoughts that I feel do go uh, good ways toward answering this question. At least it answers it for me. First, look at Luke chapter 17, verses 7 to 11. Now, this is from the, the uh, today's English version of the Bible. Suppose one of you, now remember, we, you and I, when we become Christians, we are servants. We're servants of the Lord. Suppose one of you has a servant who is plowing or looking after the sheep, and when he comes in from the field, do you say to him, hurry along, eat your meal? Of course not. Instead, you say to him, get my supper ready, then put on your apron and wait on me while I eat and drink, and after that, you may eat and drink. The servant does not deserve thanks for obeying orders, does he? It is the same with you. When you have done all you have been told to do, say, we are ordinary servants. We have only done our duty. Nothing we can do in the way of works or words can put us in debt to God. We are forever in debt to Him. After we've done our very best, we still can only say we're merely servants. Christian service is the service of a love slave. It is not out of obligation or reward or recognition. Now that idea of the love slave goes back to Exodus chapter 21, and I think you'll see it again in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 15, where they, if you bought a slave and you had him uh, seven years, at the end of the sixth year, he was to go free. You never went past that. He, you, he would, uh, at the end of the six years, you would free him. But if he wanted to stay with you, if he said, I, I have enjoyed serving you, I really love you and your family, so I, I just want to keep on serving you. And the master questions him, and if that's his desire, then he, the Bible says he takes him to the, I'm not sure how he did it, but he gazed to the lintel and he bores a hole with an awl through his ear, and he becomes a love slave forever to that master. According to Roy Hessian, the, the five in uh, the Believer's Bible Commentary, page 1,435, uh, according to Roy Hessian, the five marks of a bond servant are he must be willing to have one thing on top of another put on him without any consideration being given to him. In doing this, he must be willing not to be thanked for it. Having done all this, he must not charge his master with selfishness. He must confess that he is an unprofitable servant. He must admit that doing and bearing what he has in the way of meekness and humility, he has not done one stitch more than it was his duty to do. Love never thinks of service as a duty but always as a privilege. And love's desire is not to do the irreducible minimum, but to give its all to the person whom it loves. Two, uh, here's number two, two, rewards may or may not come in this life. Uh, I have a reference here, Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. That's the place where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not bow to the king's idol 
and uh, they knew that if they uh, didn't, that they would be thrown in the fiery furnace. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so, but they told the king, they said, King, live forever. We are not going to bow to your golden image. Our God will deliver us, but if he doesn't, we still will not bow down to that image. If, if in Job chapter 1, verse 9, Satan poses the question to God, would Job worship you if, you got, if he didn't get anything out of it? You put a hedge around him, but touch any one of his blessings and he'll curse you. And you remember Job's creed was that of the Old Testament. That is, God blesses and prospers obedience, and if you don't obey, then you, you suffer the consequences. But suddenly, without warning, calamity after calamity befell, befell Job. He lost everything. There's no immediate explanation. Everything Job believed about God suddenly seemed to be contradicted. He lost his family. He lost his wealth. He lost his health. And in a sense, he even lost his wife. Well, how did Job react? How do, you think, how do you think you would have reacted to something like that? Job's outer world lay shattered and broken, but he had a deep inner commitment and belief that God was just and loving and honorable. The Bible says in all of this, all of these calamities, in all of this, Job sinned not, neither did he charge God foolishly. Some people today, something happens and they say, well, why did God do this? Or why did God do that? And uh, it's not always, why did God do it? It's just, why did it happen? Because sin is in the, in, in, in the world. Later, Job cries out, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job didn't know what the outcome of his situation would be, yet he was ready to retain his integrity even to the death. Whether God delivered him or not, he lost everything but his faith in God, and that faith in God was what saw him through. Third, if things don't go like I think they should, is my commitment to God deep enough that it will carry me through? I don't think Job's story is an isolated one. I think God pulls back the curtain to show us what goes on behind the scenes in the life of many saints of God. Satan's accusation was, God, you don't have anyone who loves you just because you're God. People are selfish. You've got to give them things. You've got to reinforce them. You've got to reward them. No one loves you just because you're you. But God pointed to Job. And he, as he had pointed to many saints since that day that have gone through similar circumstances, and he says, devil, you're wrong. I have many who have been faithful, whether they were blessed or not. Satan's question was, will Job, Job or any man or woman serve God if they get nothing out of it? The answer is yes, yes. A man can serve God even if there is no immediate reward. When we learn that the, the way up is down, when the way to the front seat is sometimes to take the back seat, the way to, the chief, to be a chief is to be a servant, that the way to save our lives is to lose them in service for God. When the giver becomes more important than the gift, when the healer becomes more important than the healing, when the blesser becomes more important than the blessing, when the benefactor becomes more important than the benefit, then we can say with the prophet Habakkuk, which has been called one of the greatest affirmations of faith in the Bible, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vine. The labor of the olive will fail. The fields will yield no meat. The flock will be cut off from the fold. There'll be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will enjoy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet, and he will make me to walk upon high places. 
Now, if you want to kind of bring that up into the 21st century, uh, here's what the translation called the message. Here's the way uh, Eugene Peterson puts it. Though the cherry trees don't blossom and the strawberries don't ripen, though the apples are worm-eaten and the wheat fields stunted, though the sheep pens are sheepless and the cattle barns are empty, I'm singing joyful praises to God. I'm turning cartwheels of joy to my Savior God. I take heart and I gain strength. I run like a deer. I feel like I'm king of the hunt. Although the cupboards may be bare, although the billfold may be empty, although the trials may be unexplained, although I may not understand the circumstances that I am going through, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in service for my Lord. James chapter 5, verses 7 to 11, James writes, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. You may get upset, so things happen that you don't understand, but James says, Be patient under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he receives the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and patience. Behold, we count them happy that endure. You've heard of the patience of Job, and you've seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. I remember, and I want to close with this illustration. I remember uh, one of my devotional books one time, I read the, read the little example of a woman. She had this dream, and in the dream she saw three men, three women uh, kneeling in prayer. And Jesus came along. When he came to the first woman, he, he bent over, he touched her, and he spoke comforting words to her uh, and just spent, gave her some real close attention. Then he went on to the next one, and his hand dropped, and he kind of uh, patted her shoulder, uh, like, you know, keep, in, keep going. But when he came to the third one, he just walked right by her. And... The lady that was having the dream, she said, well, that first lady must really be serving him for him to, to really spend time with her. And the second one, he spent time with her. That, that third one, she must have really been bad to, for him just to walk past her. And about that time, Jesus spoke to her and said, you've got it all wrong. He said, the first lady needed what I gave her. She she just really struggles through every day. And, and if, if she didn't get some kind of reinforcement, she might not make it through one day. The, the second one, she has a, a, a lot, lot more faith, and I didn't have to spend as much time. But, oh, that third one, she, she loves me. She is so devoted to me. She, it doesn't matter what happens to her. It doesn't matter if times are good or bad. It doesn't matter... Uh, she doesn't understand what's going on. She trusts me, and she's going to serve me no matter uh, if she doesn't receive anything of it. She's going to trust me until she dies, and that's the difference. And so I trust maybe this might prick our consciences and make us examine uh, how is our commitment to God? If all the props fell out from under us. Everything, like Job, we lost everything. How deep is our commitment to the Lord? Is our commitment to the Lord so deep that no matter what happens, no matter where it happens, no matter how great the trials are, no matter uh, bring up what you may want to bring up, we will serve God through it all. That's the kind of commitment God is looking for. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandment. If you love me, serve me. So I pray that today you will examine your commitment to the Lord. If you're not saved, you can commit your life to the Lord right where you're at. 
You can just look up and say, Lord, forgive me for my sins and come into my heart. I want to serve you for the rest of my life. And I want to serve you wholeheartedly. If you're a Christian and you've looked at your life and you, you've seen places where you could really shore up uh, some of your affection for the Lord. And you may wonder, boy, if I went through what Job went through, could I, could I do that? Could I retain my integrity like he did? You've got to be able to do it if you're going to really serve the Lord and come through victorious in the end. So ask God, ask God to help you today to do and be what he wants you to be. Father, we do thank you today for this message. It, not the regular kind of messages where we take a, a text and, and just explain it, but it's where we take a principle, Lord, that is really important and we look at it. And Lord, it is important for us to look at our commitment to you and realize, Lord, that no matter what happens, no matter how it happens, no matter how bad the circumstances may be, that our commitment will be strong enough to bring us through to victory in the end. We pray, Lord, that you will strengthen us today in that commitment, for we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for The Chapel Hour with Rev. Russell Weishart and the Weishart Family Singers. For previous programs, please go to YouTube and search for The Weishart Family Singers Channel. If you're a minister, teacher, or student of the Bible and would like to access Rev. Weishart's messages, outlines, and sermon notes, please go to thechapelhour.blogspot.com. And of course, one of the best ways to stay in touch with us is on the Weishart Family Singers Facebook page. We want to thank everyone for finding us, for your encouragement, for subscribing to our channel, and for hitting that little like button. We look forward to seeing you next week on The Chapel Hour.